The time had finally come. The redemption God planned in eternity past was now unfolding in real time. Over 30 years earlier, Jesus had been sent into the world as the Lamb of God who takes away sin. It was now time for the Lamb to be slain. On Thursday, Jesus and his disciples met in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. During the meal, however, Jesus revealed some shocking news. Someone in their group would betray Jesus and hand him over to the religious leaders. Is, Is it, it I, I, Lord? Lord? It was then that Judas got up from the table, left the room, and finished what he had already set in motion. Following the Last Supper, Jesus led his disciples to a secluded garden on the Mount of Olives for a time of prayer. An hour later, several hundred soldiers, led by Judas, arrived and the Son of God was arrested. Throughout the night, Jesus was falsely accused and illegally tried by the religious leaders. Early on Friday morning, Pilate ordered Jesus to be stripped of his clothing, tied to a post, and then scourged with a Roman flagrum. The leather strips of the flagrum, embedded with bits of metal and sharp bone, bit into Jesus' torso, chest, and legs, shredding his flesh. The tremendous loss of blood from the scourging severely weakened the Savior. To mock Jesus, Roman soldiers took thorns and twisted them together to imitate a crown and smashed it on his head. Hail, Hail King, King of the, the Jews. Jews! However, all of the torture and mocking was not enough for the religious leaders. They wanted Jesus dead. And their death sentence rang out from their lips and echoed throughout the city streets. Crucify him! Crucify him! Jesus was then made to carry a large wooden beam through the streets of Jerusalem to the appointed place of execution outside the city. Severely weakened by the loss of blood, Jesus collapsed under the weight of the cross. Another man was selected from the crowds and was forced by the soldiers to carry Jesus' cross the rest of the way. When they reached the place called the skull, Jesus' arms were stretched across the beam. A soldier raised his mallet and drove a spike through Jesus' hand. A second spike was then driven through Jesus' other hand. With Jesus now firmly attached to the crossbar, the soldiers hoisted him upright and placed him on a post that was fixed in the ground. Finally, a third spike was driven through Jesus' feet. For the next six hours, God in human flesh poured out his life on the cross. As the Lamb of God hung, suspended between heaven and earth, he uttered seven final powerful statements. Each of these statements give us insight into our Savior's heart and the salvation that he came to provide. As we review these seven statements tonight, Consider the amazing love and grace that Jesus expressed as he died on the cross for us.
first saying of Jesus on the cross was a word of grace. Please join me in reading Luke 23, 33, and 34 together. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, where they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they cast lots to divide his garments. A bloodthirsty crowd gathered around the cross as Jesus was being crucified. As the Lord of creation was being executed, he was mocked and jeered and cursed. But how did Jesus respond to all this cruelty? What were his first words? Jesus' first words on the cross were a gracious appeal to the Father. His but plea was not for personal vindication, nor did he ask for help as he was being humiliated. The first words from Jesus' mouth were a plea for our forgiveness. He said, Father, forgive them. Jesus asked the Father for the removal of our sins. He prayed for the cancellation of our sin debt against God. He asked that we be cleansed from our guilt. He pleaded with the Father to remove from us the judgment that we deserve and to place that judgment on himself. Why did the Son of God ask for this? It was because of his grace. Grace forgives. As the soldiers gambled for Jesus' garments just below his bleeding body, salvation was only an arm's reach away. But they didn't see it. Jesus watched them scurry after his clothing and saw into their hearts. He knew their deepest need because grace understands. Even to this day, the Savior bears the wounds in his body from the nails. These are the only scars in heaven because they provided our healing. That is what grace does. It provides. The violence brought upon the Son of God on our behalf was horrible. But the fact remains, we are no better than the soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross. The hymn writer asks the penetrating question, were you there when they crucified my Lord? The answer is an undeniable yes. All the suffering that Jesus endured was because of us. He was crucified in our place. So in a very real sense, we were there. Jesus knew that his sacrifice was the only way the Father's justice could be satisfied. And so, as he was being crucified, he prayed, Father, forgive them. Jesus went to war for us on the cross, and he won. Grace is victorious. Take a moment and consider Jesus' word of grace. Father, forgive them.
second saying of Jesus on the cross was a word of love. Will you join me in reading John 19, 26, and 27 together? When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Some of Jesus' followers were present as he was being crucified. The past three years were now a blur, as the horrific scene before their eyes overwhelmed their minds with shock and disbelief. The memories of all the extraordinary things Jesus did now seem strangely out of place. He had miraculously fed multitudes, healed thousands, restored the broken, he had even raised the dead. Through these events, Jesus had demonstrated the promise of life. The scene unfolding before his followers, however, was the horrific reality of death. But love sacrifices for others. And the death of the Son of God was actually the greatest and fullest expression of his love. We are unable to understand what this grieving group of disciples could not that Jesus sacrificed his life so that we might have life. Jesus' words expressed the selfless love that was in his heart as he was dying for others. When Jesus said, woman, behold your son, he was ensuring that his mother would be cared for by John after he died. But he was doing more than merely making provision for his mother. He was loving her. Through his death, he was ensuring that her greatest need, her need to be reconciled to God, was being provided. This expression of love reminds us that God cares for our temporal and our eternal needs. Consider Jesus' word of love. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. i 
Jesus' third saying on the cross is a word of hope. Join me in reading Luke 23, 43 together. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was not the only one to be executed that day. Two criminals were also crucified with him, one to his right and the other to his left. One of these men looked on Jesus with scorn and contempt. In his own hour of death, he mocked Jesus. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But these blasphemous words were quickly met with rebuke from the other criminal. Do you not fear God? We are being justly executed, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then, in a remarkable act of personal faith, he looked to Jesus and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom? This criminal understood that death was the just consequence for his sin. However, he also recognized that the Savior being crucified right next to him had the power to grant him mercy. Jesus' response to this repentant thief was filled with hope. He declared, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That day, both of the criminals who were crucified beside Jesus died. However, only one, the one clinging in faith to the Savior, enjoyed the rich inheritance of everlasting life. Because of the cross, there is always hope for sinners. The Bible declares, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As Jesus hung on the cross, he was giving his life for every sinner who, like that repentant thief, looks to him in repentant faith for mercy. Jesus had previously declared, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but passes from death to life. Take a moment and consider Jesus' word of hope. Today you will be with me in paradise.
my soul to say, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it away. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus' fourth saying on the cross is a word of agony. Please join me in reading Matthew 27, 46 together. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The suffering Jesus endured on the cross is staggering. The beating and scourging of his body, the extreme blood loss, and the physical trauma of being nailed to a cross were horrific. Yet there was something which Jesus endured on the cross that was even more brutal than what he experienced physically. It was the suffering he endured spiritually. Jesus cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? was a cry of deep, Spiritual The awful weight of our sin, the fury of wrath leveled against that sin, and being forsaken by the Father because of it is beyond what we can fully comprehend. Why did the Father forsake the Son at what would seem to be the point of his greatest need. In turning his face away from his son, the father was doing what had to be done to save us from the judgment we deserve. It was at that moment that his wrath was being poured out on Jesus instead of on us. The spiritual agony Jesus endured on the cross was for us. He bore our sin, and he suffered the judgment we deserve. 700 years earlier, Isaiah declared why the Messiah would have to suffer. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Take a moment and think of Jesus' word of agony. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forbid 
Jesus' fifth saying on the cross is a word of suffering. Let's read John 19, 28 together. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. These words, I thirst, demonstrate that Jesus, who was fully God, was also fully man. It is ironic that the one who spoke the seas into existence and declared, whoever believes in me shall never thirst, was himself now suffering from thirst and dehydration. Jesus had commanded waves to be still and had walked on the waters of Galilee. So on the cross, he could have easily provided for his own human thirst, but he did not. You see, all of Jesus' spiritual and physical sufferings were for a purpose. As he was being put to death as the substitute for sinners, he refused to shrink back from any suffering on the cross. The words, I thirst, give us a glimpse into the intensity of Jesus' suffering. At this point, Jesus has gone over 30 hours without sleep and has suffered tremendous blood loss from being beaten, scourged, and nailed to the cross. The muscles in his body are cramping from intense dehydration. His tongue was swollen, and his throat severely parched. Right on schedule, a Roman soldier unwittingly fulfilled an Old Testament prophecy. He filled a sponge with sour wine put it on a hyssop branch, and extended it up to Jesus' parched mouth. Consider Jesus' word of suffering. I thirst. sacred head now wounded with grief and shame way down now scornfully surrounded with thorns thy only crown how art thou pale with anguish with soul
Jesus' sixth saying was on the cross, it was a word of finality. Join me in reading John 19.30 together. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What exactly did Jesus announce was finished before he died? Certainly his life and the incredible suffering he endured was coming to an end. But Jesus was declaring that his work as the atoning sacrifice for sin was now complete. Jesus had come to do the Father's will and fulfill it to the very last detail. Nothing more would ever be needed to satisfy God's wrath against sin. It was finished. The power of sin had been defeated. The power of death had been conquered. And the power of the enemy had been vanquished forever. Jesus had, done, had completed all that was required for God's enemies to be reconciled to himself. Jesus' loud declaration, it is finished, announced that divine justice had been satisfied and peace with God had been provided. Because Jesus finished his work on the cross, salvation is available. There is nothing that anyone can add to Jesus' completed work. Sinners simply need to turn from their sin and trust in the Savior who finished the work. Consider Jesus' word of finality. It is finished. you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Jesus' final saying on the cross was a word of rest. Join me in reading Luke 23, 46 together. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. With the breath of God, the universe began. 
and near a dusty Judean road, suspended on a wooden cross, Jesus breathed in and out. The air of a world he himself had created. Each deliberate breath was an agony. Each intentional word was a torture. And so lifting himself to speak one final time, Jesus loudly proclaimed, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This loud declaration demonstrated the confidence with which Jesus entrusted his soul to the Father. With one final confident cry, our Lord yielded up his soul, knowing that the Father's will had been accomplished and that his work as the Son had been accepted. Neither Jesus' life or his death would be in vain. Jesus lived a perfect life without sin. And he, as a willing sacrifice, he died in our place so that any who believe in him would live forever. The only way to eternal life is through Jesus' death. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Because Jesus died, anyone who turns from their sin and turns to him to embrace him by faith will have eternal life. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because Jesus knew that his work, his sacrifice was enough to reconcile sinners to God, he took in one final agonizing breath. And then, so that all could hear, he used that breath to confidently entrust his soul to the one who would preserve it. Have you entrusted your soul to the Father? Consider Jesus' word of rest. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Bye. 